Mr. Majeski's Anatomy 32 class, Chapter 8, Part 1, Upper Limbs. So today we'll be talking about the appendicular skeleton. And it's important to point out here that as humans we have what's referred to as bilateral symmetry, which means our right half looks sort of kind of identical to our left half. So therefore, any time we learn about the bones of, say, the right arm, there is a corresponding bone in the left arm. So that helps cut down the number of bones we need to learn specific details about. So the appendicular skeleton is attached to the axial skeleton by two girdles, the pectoral girdle for the upper arms and the pelvic girdle for the lower legs. In the upper skeleton, you can see that the pectoral girdle it consists of the clavicle, or collarbone, and the scapula, or shoulder blade. The clavicle has four unique important features. It has an acromial end, which has an articulating facet, and that is basically in the shoulder side of the clavicle. Um, near there is the co conoid tubercle, which uh, sticks out. You have the long shaft of the clavicle, and then at the, the medial end you have the what's referred to as the sternal end, because it articulates with the sternum. The scapula, on the other hand, is a rather odd-shaped bone. It sort of wraps around from your lateral side a little bit toward the posterior side, um, running along a number of the ribs. Important features in the scapula include the acromion, which is um, sort of a superior process that articulates with the clavicle. You have the glenoid cavity, where the humerus is going to articulate with the scapula, and a little bit superior to that is this coracoid process. Now if you look at the main triangle, I guess, of the scapula, you see that you have a lateral border on the lateral side, an inferior angle, very inferior, uh, a medial border, and then a superior angle. So superior angle clearly above the inferior angle. And then you have sort of this curvature on the um, bot bulk of the scapula that's referred to as the subscapular fossa. If you look on the posterior view of the scapula, you see that you have a uh, long scapular spine sticking out, and above that is the supraspinous fossa, and below it is the infraspinous fossa. Next is the humerus. If you look at the anterior view of the humerus, you see that its proximal end, you have a greater tubercle, a intertubercle sulcus or groove that wraps around the lesser tubercle. A little further down you find the deltoid tuberosity which is more of a, a thick and rough patch on the uh, shaft of the humerus. And all the way at the distal end you will have the lateral epicondyle, slightly uh, proximal to the capitulum, and then the medial epicondyle, which is slightly uh, proximal to the trochlea. And then above the capitulum and the trochlea is the radial fossa, where the radius um, can sort of fit in, and the coronoid fossa. If you take a posterior view, you can see uh, the head of the humerus, which is then followed by its anatomical neck. And then a little further uh, distal is what's referred to as the surgical neck. And the surgical neck is where the humerus often has many breaks occur. Then on the shaft you have the radial groove, which is just a groove that blood vessels run along. And then the ulcranian fossa, which is basically where the uh, ulna is going to be able to fit when your arm is fully extended. All right, the ulna, one of the forearm bar bones, it runs to the pinky, and it has, between it and the radius, the interosseous membrane, which is a connective tissue that connects the two bones. Taking an anterior view, you can see that at the proximal end, you have the trochlear notch that's going to fit into the trochlea of the humerus. You have the coronoid process in front. And then also on the side, you have a radial notch where the radius's head will fit in. You have the shaft, and along the shaft is the interosseous crest, where the interosseous membrane will connect. And then at the distal end is the head of the ulna. 
with a posterior view, you can see the ocranon, which is sort of the, the bump that sticks out. If you're touching your elbow, that's actually what you're touching. And the styloid process at the far distal end, which is just a little bit of bone sticking out. With the radius, again, it is connected by the interosseous membrane to the ulna. The radius's proximal end has the head of the radius, and below that is the neck. And then you see a large rough bump referred to as the radial tuberosity. Uh, that's followed by the long shaft, and along the shaft is the interosseous crest, again, where the interosseous membrane will attach to the radius. And then at the distal end, you see a styloid process and the ulnar notch, which would articulate with the ulna. So, if we take a look at an elbow, where you have the humerus articulating with the ulna and the radius, you see that the trochlear notch of the ulna is going to be articulating with the trochlea of the humerus, and the head of the radius is going to be articulating with the capitulum. Carpals, these are the wrist bones. There are eight of these. And you may find it useful to remember their order from um, lateral to medial, um, starting at the proximal to distal rows, by thinking of the um, mnemonic, stop letting those people touch the cadaver's hand, where the first letter of each word is the same as the first letter of the different bones. Of course, then you still have to remember the names of the carpals, which are the scaphoid, followed by the lunate, followed by the triquetrum, and sort of on top of that is the pisiform. And then going back to the lateral side, you have the trapezium, followed by the trapezoid, then the capitate, and the hamate. Uh, from there you get the metacarpals, which are the bones basically in your palm. They are all called a, a metacarpal. They are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, where the numbering of the 1 starts at the thumb, or pollux. And they each have a base that is at the uh, wrist, a shaft, and then a head that's going to articulate with the phalanges. So, after the metacarpals are the phalanges. They are each called a phalange, or phalanix, and they, on four of the five fingers, you have a proximal, middle, and distal phalange. However, with the thumb, you have only a proximal and a distal phalange. There is no middle phalange. And they are also numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, starting with the thumb as number 1. And they, being long bones, also have a base, which articulates with the metacarpals, a shaft, and a head. And that is this lecture on the upper apical skeleton.